Um, it's uh, yes, we get it. We're going to be recording the session. Um, but so very happy to be here, excited to be chatting about this very important topic. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I um, fully support, I think this is such a great idea. You guys are smart cookies for um, thinking about putting this together and all of your hard works and making this happen. I'm sure a lot of aunties and a lot of um, young folks who are um, looking to get married are making dog for you. So um, definitely kudos to you guys for all the hard work that you're doing. Um, great job, I support. So for tonight's talk, um, I um, thought a lot about how to structure this because in general, the topic of marriage can be so um, contentious and like, it's just so, there's just so much to talk about. There's so much to say, there's so much to cover. And sometimes it's difficult to think about how to structure and organize things. So um, as we have done a little bit in some of the previous talks that we've had together, I'm going to try to take a very foundational groundwork approach. So a lot of what I want to talk about um, doesn't actually directly go into like the very logistical, who should you get married to or what you should look, what you should look for or what should your like ideal spouse be like. I'm actually going to try to give you some tools so that you can think through that process together once this talk is over. Um, in the beginning, during the presentation, a lot of what I'm going to um, talk about is um, just very foundational and um, giving you some just like food for thought. And then in the Q&A, I think if you um, whatever hasn't been covered in the in the talk or um, if you have any other questions that you think can further this discussion and be more practical and like specific to specific scenarios, um, I think it'd be better to do that in a Q&A fashion. Um, so feel free to um, use what I'm saying to like apply it to whatever real life um, situation that you or someone you know may be dealing with. And we can kind of think it through together as, um, you know, as a community and be supportive in that way. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, Zainab, can I just get a confirmation okay. that you can hear me okay? Yes, okay, perfect. So today we're going to be talking about um, the foundations of marriage preparation and spouse selections. My goal for you is to have um, um, access to some key ingredients that um, we think are key um, and super important when you're thinking about how to go about the thought process of preparing yourself for marriage and then selecting a spouse. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, I'm thinking of uh, a roadmap. So in terms of the roadmap that we're going to be following today, we're going to start with thinking a little bit about um, some of the foundations of why does this matter anyways? And we want to look at the foundations of marriage and um, uh, why we should care about the topic. And then I'm going to uh, transition us into talking a little bit about some of our basic psychosocial needs and how that relates to marriage. And then we're going to go in depth into um, two ingredients that are um, particularly important in this process. And then we're going to go through some scenarios, some like sample examples that of stories that you may have heard. Um, and I'm going to bring in stories from um, work that I have done. So they're coming from like actual people. And then we can go um, through the Q&A. So let's talk about foundations. The first thing that, and if you have heard heard um, uh, some of the previous uh, conversations that we've had together, um, what I like to do is to go to the core. So start from scratch, start from building the building blocks. When you want to think about something and determine how you make a decision about something, I think it's super important for you to be really well grounded in why you're making that decision in the first place. Why is it, why does it matter? And feel really grounded in the way that you're making the decision and then go about making that decision. So the first step uh, the first step in doing that, as always, is to ground yourself in, in your creator and in the creator's plan for um, your existence. So um, we talked a lot about this, that as Muslims and um, as believing people, um, we have learned to situate who we are in our sense of self and our creator. And so thinking about marriage and what marriage entails and um, how it should go, how we should go about it should also be rooted in the, in the creator who created us and created marriage for us. Marriage is, um, 
has been noted to be and is um, a part of a plan that the creator or Allah has um, for us. And it's the most wholesome plan because we know that when Allah created us, he created a wholesome plan for us to be able to live this life and live it to the fullest potential. Um, in Allah's plan, the most comprehensive, um, deep, all in all best approach through which humans can fulfill the needs that they have and um, reach their fullest potential is through the structure of the family. So we have a lot of um, uh, evidence in Islam and a whole lot of teachings are, that substantiate this, but essentially the idea is that within an Islamic framework, but I mean, this applies to all human beings for when Allah created humans, the structures through which he intended for them to reach their fullest potentials and meet their needs was through the structure of the family, and AKA, which starts through the union between two people. Um, and this is a part of the larger um, organism that, that uh, or organizational structure that Allah gave to the entire universe. The family structure is the structure or the mechanism through which a lot of the, all of the needs that human beings have can be met and can be at least started to be met. And then, I mean, you know, people then get married again, get married when they grow up. And so they make their own families. But the point is that that, the, that unit of the family is the central unit in a lost creation and a lost um, organizational structure for us. So I want you to remember one of the things that I think is important to think about when we're grounding or thinking which I think is actually quite humbling, is that marriage isn't just necessarily when you're thinking about who I want to get married to and finding my other half. It's not always just about you finding your other half so that you can live happily ever after. It's not about you and you, you're only about you and your feelings of fulfillment. Fulfillment. It's also about um, trusting in and playing your part in a lost larger um, structural mechanism for us. This is, you're playing your part. You're doing your um, due diligence as part of the plan that Allah has set forth for this, for, for us, for this universe. And I want to point your attention to a hadith that I thought was really interesting. This hadith is from the Prophet and the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him. And, um, and the translation of the Arabic is something to the effect of in Islam, there isn't a foundation that is built that is more beloved to Allah than a marriage. And there's so much to be um, uh, just gleaned from this one hadith, because first of all, marriage is referred to as a foundation. Um, the word banat that is used here is, I think there's a lot of room for reflection on the, the use of this term, because um, it's not just, again, it's not, the thought of it is not just for you to feel like experience this happily ever after idea. Marriage is thought of as this foundation that um, uh, facilitates so many other things throughout the life peer, lifetime of a person and persons and communities. So um, its, value is very, its value is not just in the union of the two people meeting each other's needs. It's, it has a lot of other implications as well. You going through this process of uh, preparing yourself for marriage and selecting a spouse and starting the family is not just about the two of you. You're part of a much larger effort in um, doing your part as part of a lost creation. There's a purpose in, in your effort in doing this that in addition to benefiting you is also a part of the larger structure that Allah has intended. So the two things that I want to um, hone in on are the basic human needs so the human the the human needs that are going to be fulfilled that's part of this marriage which Allah has intended for us and reaching your full potential the question that I want us to think about is what are those basic needs what are the needs that can be met throughout the marriage throughout a marriage and a, and a family structure let's try to kind of go in depth into that and answer that question um I want to give a quick explanation that the use of the term psychosocial is different than psychological. Um, someone actually raised this question for me. Why do I use the term psychosocial so much instead of psychological? And there is a point to it. Psycho psychological is actually quite, I think in, in, in the way that it has historically been defined, it's a little bit limiting because it um, only includes the self and inside of the self. And it's always from the perspective of the self outward. Psychosocial is meant, the use of that term is meant to encompass a lot more. 
the idea is that it's not everything isn't just about the individual psychology but there's like this whole reciprocal relationship with social and society as well so it's just meant to capture a more holistic version of humans but let's delve into what those um, basic needs that we have are this is not going to be an exhaustive list there is a whole lot of like lots of schools of thought around um, what basic psychosocial needs are there's a lot of literature and a lot of scholarship on different cultures defining these in different ways different religious religions explaining them the first thing that we can think of is that we know that there are some, let's start with this. We know that there are some basic psychosocial needs that we as humans have that the creator um, created us with. He created us with certain needs that we have and us navigating these needs is actually a part of our existence. What we do with these needs and the choices that we make in relation to these needs is a big part of our purpose in this world, actually. So we have these basic needs. Let's, let's kind of create that as, com as a common ground. The next question is what then, okay, we have these common, we have these common basic needs. What are those basic needs? Um, I'm gonna use, what I'm gonna actually do is to use some psychological theories to answer that question. But before we do that, the first thing I wanna say is that it's always important to keep in mind that those needs that you have are, should the way you think about the needs that you have should be guided by the one who created you. So before we delve into these psychological theories that human beings came up with, I just want us to ground that our thinking and thinking through those psychological theories and the idea that there is a creator who created us and whatever we're thinking of and whatever we think our needs are, it should actually be grounded in um, his, his creation of us. And it should be checked with, or we should always make sure that whatever we're thinking psychological theories of our basic needs are, are aligned with um, what we have learned from Allah through the Quran and the Hadith and et cetera. And I'd also like to point out that if you um, just taking a God centric approach, it's also really important to keep in mind that the most basic need um, that we should all strive for, even if we don't feel it, is a need for nearness towards our creator. So let's just let's just kind of like ground situate ourselves in that headspace. Now we can kind of move on to, all right, what are the psychological theories that historically have talked about what our basic needs are? There's a, people have given all sorts of opinions and thoughts around um, what are the most basic things that you could say that everybody shares and all human beings have, despite their culture and where ge geography, where they've been raised, et cetera. There, there's a lot of theories. We can't possibly go through them. I'm going to name a few. But what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to pull from them and we're going to go and, um, and look at the ones that um, I think are most relevant for the idea of partnerships and marriage. So some of the theories um, talk about theories of belonging. So having the basic need for belonging with other groups of people. Other theories talk about self-determination. They have to do with your ability to accomplish your goals. And then Maslow, which is probably um, uh, the most uh, well-known, and um, if you've ever taken a psych course, you've probably heard of him, um, has this idea of a um, hierarchy of needs where he's actually created this system of understanding what, um, what need has to be met before an another need can be met. So he starts off with your physiological needs. And then if your physiological needs like for food and shelter and things of that nature have been met, then you have a need to feel safe and secure. And then you have a need for love and belonging. And then finally, it kind of starts to ele elevate and become more refined. And your needs for um, having self-esteem and self-actualization are actually like at the top. This is, these were Maslow's ideas. So this guy came up with this idea that like, you know, you need these needs to be hierarchical in these ways. There's a lot of room for discussion around whether these needs actually do exist and are they needs are they hierarchical in these ways but these are just to give you some ideas some of the basic ideas around um, having basic psychosocial needs look in in the psychological literature look like this let's bring it all that all of that together and then let's try to look at those psycho basic psychosocial needs that are relevant to marriage and partnership so i have um divided them into three parts we all have, and as I'm going through this, I want you to reflect on um, uh, whether you experience this in, your, in yourself and what this looks like. 
So we all have a basic need to feel a sense of belonging, relatedness, and warmth. So this need has to do with your need to feel like you are wanted by others, like others like to be near to you. you your need to feel like you are connected with other people, like feeling like you're able to establish a back and forth relationship with another person. And one of the um, most intense ones is feeling like others care about you when you're in distress. So feeling like your distress is of prime importance to another person. All of these can be fit under this category of um, having the need for belonging, for relatedness, and for warmth. A second area of needs has to do with feeling like you are competent, able, like you're self-efficacious, and like you're agentic. So this is a little bit, this vibe is now a little bit different. This, these kinds of needs have to do with um, your need to feel like you can set a goal and you can accomplish that goal and feeling like you're special, like you're special to someone and that you're different from the people who are around you, that there's something special about you that makes you stand out among other people. And then feeling like you have a level of power to drive what happens around you. That, that has to do with being agentic. Like you're able to assert a certain level of control. When you want to do something, you can do that thing. And then the third area has to do with a need for structure, discipline, and purpose. So it, this has to do with um, having a life where you can depend on a predictable pattern, where things aren't always chaotic. So feeling like things kind of follow a specific pattern having a need to feel like um, things are in order. And then also the super, super basic need to feel like you have a purpose in life and that you're going places, that you're going somewhere, that you're headed towards a direction, you're not stagnant. So when you're thinking about your basic needs, the big picture is to categorize it around the needs for relatedness and belonging to groups of people, your own needs for feeling like you're competent, like you're able to do stuff, like you're able to get things done and that you um, uh, have, a, have the power to move things forward. And then the need to feel like there's this level of structure and organization and predictability in your life, that things are not chaotic and that you have a direction and you're going places. Keep those three things in your mind as these big picture categories. So now let's, let's put all of that together. So far, what we've talked about is that marriage is important. It's a part of the structure that Allah has created. It's a part of this like mechanism that Allah has ordained for us to live through. This is where it's at. This is where we're supposed to be meeting a lot of the needs that Allah has placed within us, within the structures that he has allowed us. What are those basic needs? We have some basic needs around relatedness, some basic needs around um, competence, and then some basic needs around a sense of purpose and structure. And now we want to think about practically what do we do in order to translate that into, in the marriage preparation process? If there's one thing that I can emphasize, now, there's one thing that I want you to take away and one thing that I can't emphasize enough when folks um, ask about and uh, talk about the idea of getting married and preparing for marriage. And even after you get married, inshallah, in the second um, part of the, this series, we'll talk about marriage and folks who are married and just fostering that. This ingredient, I can't emphasize this ingredient enough. And that ingredient is self-awareness. So self-awareness um, revolves around the idea of knowing yourself and being aware of the things about yourself that are influencing the partnership with the other person. The first question, the first question that I want um, us to think about in terms of self-awareness is the ability to distinguish between what is a need and what is a want. So wanting a tall husband, wanting a, I don't know, like a short wife or wanting a whatever insert, whatever physiological parameter that you want, or wanting somebody who makes like six figures or wanting somebody who is in tech or like as a lawyer or as a doctor, or I don't know, insert whatever other um, want is a want that's not necessarily connected with um, although I'm, I'm happy to, for people to like argue otherwise, but those are things that we typically categorize as wants. It's okay to have wants. It's not like you actually get to have certain preferences and wants, but they're wants. They're not necessarily needs. So the first thing that I want 
there, like the first thing that I want to encourage you to have in your thinking process is the ability to distinguish between what is a want and what is a need. What is a basic psychological need that I have? And what is something that I really want and I find really attractive? Or what is something that really just feels like I would like to wake up to every morning? Those are two different things. The second thing to then think about is, all right, okay, I'm going to like try to make this distinction between there are certain things that are just needs in it, like they're needs. What are the needs among all of these things that I described? There are so many different ways in which needs can be can matter to people. So to every one of the people who uh, every one person who's on this call, some of the needs that I just talked about may seem a lot less important than some of the other needs. And that's because some of the life experiences that you've had anywhere from like physiology. So your genes and the way that your mother carried you in the womb, all the way to the kind of attachment you experienced growing up, your life experiences, the geography of where you grew up. I mean, so many things can go into making some of these basic needs be more important for you than they are for another person. So your job is to have enough self-reflection to be able to know because of these reasons, because of what has happened, because of whatever experience I have had, these particular needs are important to me. And here's why. These are the needs that really stand out. They are like the top of the list. And then when you're able to then say, okay, I have, I have these, these needs, then you're able to say, all right, I have these needs that are non-negotiable. So like I have X, this, th these number of needs that are my non-negotiables, these are needs that I really have to have met in order to feel a sense of peace. And then you have, we all have needs that are actually areas of improvement for us. So you may experience an area of need really intensely that feels really strongly. But if you reflect and if you self-reflect and have this level of self-awareness, it's actually, you'll actually come to realize that some, some of our needs are actually, they're not necessarily things that we um, are, the level that we want is not what we are, is not what we are entitled to. They're actually areas of improvement for us. So for example, if you, I'll just give a really quick um, example here. If you are, let's say, um, uh, your need for a sense of um, relatedness with someone includes you needing to be attached to that person like 24 seven, like you need that person to be available to you 24 seven. I don't know if you guys have seen um, that, uh, th those videos where like somebody called the ex, the, it's a meme. And the expectation is like, here's how I expect my husband to answer my phone call. And then the phone rings and the person is holding a bunch of cups and all of a sudden everything, like they drop everything and they answer the phone call. That's, that's, the, that's a need, that's an area for, um, for improvement. The need to constantly nonstop be attached to someone without a break. That's an, it could be a need. It could be that you experience it as a need, but it's certainly an area of improvement and being aware of what parts of you, what are your needs, but then which of your needs are values and things that you can assert, and which of your needs are areas where you need support in improving them is really important. And this part is actually, so um, I encourage you guys to ask a question about this later during the question and answer, because I think this is a part, this is where a lot of the conflicts end up happening between um, uh, new, either couples or people who are potentially considering to be couples because sometimes we have needs that we experience really intensely as needs. If we don't recognize that they are areas for improvement and we feel a sense of entitlement to them, um, but they're not, the other person doesn't experience it as a, a need that they can meet, that's where it creates this huge strife. So we can always come back to that later. Let's move on. I want to insert a quick reminder here again. Remember to center the needs that you want the needs that you have um, around your creator. So situate yourself around these needs that I'm experiencing, these needs that I, that I have, where are they coming from? But how do I situate them around the way my creator has created me and what my creator has intended for me to do and how my creator has intended for me to operate this world? Okay, so take out your phones. Um, we have a Q, I have a QR code here. And what I'm going to ask you is to, um, my uh, hosts have 
assured me that everybody on this call is going to know how to use a QR code. <laughs> so um, if the QR code didn't work, feel free to use that link that's on top. What use this QR code? You don't need to put in your name. I don't think it's gonna. It's. I don't think it's gonna show. But um, and you're what you're gonna do is you're gonna rank. We're gonna take like a one minute. Um, re review the needs and just rank the needs that you think are most important to you. And then I'm gonna report back what the group um, shares. Whoops, okay, let me share the, put, I'm gonna put the QR code back up here. Dana, it says the poll is full. Okay, all right. So our capacity for accepting responses has good capacity. So here's what it looks like. Let me actually change my um, what I'm sharing so that you guys can see. It's really quickly. Here is what it looks like. So the majority of the people rated the sense of belonging, relatedness, and warmth as top. Wanting the sense of structure, discipline, and purpose was second. And then feeling competent, self-efficacious, and agentic um, is third. So this is, this is a really, really brief exercise for you to just think about self-awareness in yourself around um, uh, where um, what your preferences are. But it, I think it's also interesting um, for you when you're thinking about your partner and folks who you're talking to and just the community around what matters to people, regardless of what people purport, regardless of what version of themselves people put out there. I think um, this is aligned with what we know matters to people. It's also aligned with what we know um, uh, people tell us matters to them. Feeling like you are wanted by another person and feeling like you belong to another um, partnership, not, not belong to the person, but belong to the group, to the family structure, is one of the most basic human needs that when met can solve a lot of the interpersonal conflicts that exist. Answering the question how you do that is a, is a whole other story. But if we can all agree, and if we can all just have this tool to know that our need to feel like we belong and our need to feel like we are wanted by others and that when we're distressed, others care about us. And also knowing that, that those needs are important to our partners and the potential partners is one of the most basic um, um, central ideas of um, having a successful partnership. Okay, let's, let's move on. So, um, the other key ingredient that I want to point to, which is just um, almost like a switch of um, what we were just talking about, is after you have a self-awareness of yourself and you have an idea around, all right, here are the things that, here are the needs that I have, here are the things that I want, um, and then here are the needs that matter to me, and here are the needs are that are areas of improvement. The second step in preparing for being able to have a fruitful conversation with someone in determining whether you're a good match for each other is then having an awareness of 
who the other person is, what kind of another person is going to um, be right or be a good fit for your needs. So first things first, again, let's go back to distinguishing between needs and wants, because I think this part is really important, especially in some of our um, communities and the conversations that we commonly hear. Um, what kind of person, first of all, who are my options? And then what kind of person meets the, my needs and what kind of person meets my wants? And then what happens if somebody meets my wants, but they don't meet my needs? That's usually the biggest mistake that a lot of us, like a lot of folks tend to make. And then uh, what kind of person can meet my needs, but they may not necessarily meet my wants. What do I do with that? Another question to ask here is what is a good balance? Like how can I balance somebody meeting this percentage of my needs and this percentage of my wants? That's another follow-up question that um, we can talk about. Um, so another, so the, what to, Again, like thinking about what kind of person is suited to meet my needs. Um, and then I think another thing to think about and, and the other person is what kind of person is suited to support me in those parts of my needs that are areas of improvement for me. So not everybody can understand if you have an area of need that is, or if you have a type of need that you experience really intensely, but you recognize as an area of need for you, not everybody is going to have empathy for that. Not everybody is going to be equipped to deal and appreciate the fact that that is an area of um, improvement for you. So being critical about that also uh, matters. And then again, last one, let's ground ourselves in the idea that what kind of person can help support me in accomplishing nearness to Allah and the creator. So um, the last thing I want us to do before moving on um, to the question and answer and hopefully having a fruitful conversation is I want us to look at just two scenarios. These um, just come from like, you know, real people dealing with real issues. Um, and then I have another QR code and I want you guys to so read the story. I'll give a like a spiel about the story. Feel free to read it. And then um, uh, give your thoughts in the QR code that is there. And then I'll read some of the responses that we have. So the first person I want to talk about is a young man named Rahman. Um, Rahman is a 26-year-old young man. He just completed his MBA from UC Berkeley. Um, and his parents immigrated to the U.S. when he was pretty young. Um, and his parents got a divorce when he was 15. So he spent most of his life with his mom. Um, his father moved back to Pakistan. And he, this was pretty upsetting to him. So this was his dismay. Um, so he traveled to visit him during the summers, but his father got remarried when he was 18, and he feels that they've kind of grown pretty distant from each other ever since. Rahman has two younger sisters, but um, he notices that they're even more distant from their father than he is, but he's tried to play a pretty supportive role for his younger sisters and really enjoys spending time with them, and he feels really proud that his sisters look up to him. Um, when he was younger, he often heard his parents fighting and using violent language against each other. Um, and he really hated this. And when this would happen, when he was old enough, he would take his two younger sisters to a neighborhood park to avoid um, being around the arguments. Recently, his mom has started to like encourage him to find a spouse and look for a partner. And he actually um, loves the idea of building a partnership with someone because he really feels ready to be showering someone with um, his love. But he also has a lot of stress and fears that the kind of relationship that he had with his father is going to impact his ability to be a good spouse. Um, and he feels a lot of stress about the prospect of um, his partner abandoning him one day, regardless of how much effort he puts into the relationship. So if you can scan the QR code and just kind of let me know some of your thoughts and I'll read your um, responses. Uh, is anyone else having trouble scanning this one? I think um, Zainab Atai, if you can change the presentation view so that Zainab's not in the corner because her uh, her window is blocking the bottom of the QR code. This is good now. Also, I put the code in the chat, so the oh, link in know. the chat too. So if you can't see it, you can use the link in the chat.
So a lot of what I'm um, what I'm hearing and a lot of what um, one of the most common things that people are talking about is a sense of belonging and warmth. So the relatedness um, uh, that we talked about, a sense of feeling like a person is um, um, there for him. That's kind of like a common theme that we're seeing. Another thing that is um, standing out, which is interesting, that's a kind of just um, there's room for this. So somebody said someone who's open minded and it, something that they added was um, that they are quiet, non triggering. So he isn't reminded of his parents fights. And I think um, they're re referring to this idea of um, uh, uh, maintaining us uh, being extra careful about having a peaceful relationship and a peaceful interaction between each other. Um, a lot of, yeah, a lot of about, and then another thing that I think people talked a lot about is um, uh, understanding his and accepting his past and the kinds of experience that, um, understanding his past and another person said somebody who a spouse who expresses their love and care to him somebody called him a bichada um and i think another thing that um stands out also is to um uh make space i'm, I'm paraphrasing what this person said but um, making space for there to be um, security in the relationship that he is not his father and that that's not um, the kind of person who he is necessarily embodying and that he is his own person. So one thing that I um, uh, want to stress about Rahman's story and I want, I, I, um, uh, a lot of what has been shared is um, exactly what we were also thinking and things that stand out for him. Um, I think the um, one of the uh, if the reason I included this anecdote in the story, um, the part about him trying to establish a relationship with his father and that not necessarily being the case um, is and at this point now we're just um, envisioned like we're just envisioning and assuming that this is something that is going to happen. But one of the exper important experiences that Rahman has had is um, making an effort and putting himself out there as an agentic person to go to Pakistan, go back and forth and try to establish a relationship with his father and trying to uh, meet this basic need of his that hasn't really been successful. So he's made an effort. He's not like, he's not a person who's just sitting, not doing anything. He's made an effort. He's trying to make this happen. And this hasn't necessarily occurred. One of the things that that does is, first of all, it can reflect in his level of self-esteem and being able to influence his surroundings. So his ideas may include, like, regardless of how much I try to build a strong relationship, things may actually end up faltering and going wrong. So then when we think about the kind of person who, first of all, when we think about his needs versus wants, the needs to feel consistently validated may not necessarily be, it, we could possibly say that it's an area of improvement, but the spouse that he, um, the spouse that he would look for would be somebody who can make space for the fact that while it is an area of improvement, he has a basic need for this fear of abandonment and for this fear of um, uh, his efforts coming to fruition when he's putting an effort into something um, to be valid. And so there is, here's an example of a need that could be an area of improvement, but the person would have to recognize that this is a need that this person has that is an area of improvement. All right, let's move on to the next and last story. Here's another QR code. I forgot to give the explanation of the story. So I'm going to quickly walk you guys through um, Rahma's story this time. I didn't go through a lot of trouble to just renaming these people. I just <laughs> took out the end. 
So Rahma is a 24 year old young woman. She just got into medical school. She's super excited, super joyful about this. Her parents are from Iraq and they um, are refugees who were forcibly displaced because of um, persecution that they were facing there. So she was three when they left um, Iraq, but they lived in multiple countries before coming to the US and settling here when she was seven. Um, when she started school, she had a lot of challenges because she couldn't really express herself and explaining who she was and why she looked the way that she did to her peers. And so that put her, um, that gave her a lot of stress um, and it made her feel pretty powerless in um, influencing the things that were happening around her. And then her family had to move from state to state because of high living costs. So she moved a whole lot. The um, and she wasn't able to keep the friends that she would make in um, the schools. So before she graduated high school, she had moved um, uh, four more times. And then she really never felt like she could build a really strong relationship with any of her peers. She remembers telling herself, I'm going to settle somewhere and no one can make me move anywhere. Um, her parents are pretty loving and they're close to each other. And despite all of the instability that they've experienced, um, uh, she feels like they have a really strong um, connection between her parents and her siblings. She's recently started to think about the idea of getting married. Um, and she knows that she wants someone who is pretty dedicated to his family as um, her father has been throughout her life. But she has a lot of doubts about entering into a partnership with someone because it feels really unpredictable and chaotic. She doesn't really know, there's no way for her to know what to expect and what could happen, especially in light of a lot of the, some of the, um, um, there was not enough room for me to include this, but um, and especially in light of some of the experiences that some of her other friends, girlfriends have had um, with getting married with guys who have ended up being different than what they expected them to be. Um, and so uh, she feels really strongly about having to change her life plans again, because of someone else. So a lot of what we're seeing are uh, around um, the idea of structure, discipline, consistency. I love it. Somebody says, um, somebody who's low maintenance. It's a, it's a plus. But I, uh, um, very accurately so, a lot of folks are talking about needing to make her feel safe. Um, the thing that really stands out here it, as part of Rahma's story is um, uh, understanding that the need that she has for stability, for consistency, for there to be um, uh, uh, structure comes from a, um, a history of not having had been able to assert herself throughout her life and what happened to her, but having to deal with the really strong consequences of that. And so the, um, um, similar to Rahman's story, although we can't expect Rahman to be a person who shows no level of flexibility in where she moves to or where she goes or how much like unpredictability she has to experience. So there's like a certain level that has to happen. It is so very important in this context for her to be looking for someone who can hold space for the fact that um, un instability, unpredictability, having to make things, having to make big changes is going to be experienced really intensely by her. 
And it would, it is a basic need for her to experience elevated levels of consistency and discipline and structure um, in her life. So in the interest of time, let's um, move on. Um, so I wanna just share um, a couple of takeaways um, with uh, you guys before wrapping up and then we can transition inshallah. Um, the first thing that, um, if there's one thing that I really wanna encourage everybody to um, make an effort to try to accomplish is building self-awareness around what your needs are, why you have the needs that you do, and how do you, how does that manifest itself in um, the kind of spouse that you are looking for? And distinguishing between, first distinguishing between needs and wants, and then determining what your needs are, why you have those needs, where are those needs coming from? Why do those needs matter to you? And then thinking about how they translate into a partnership with another person. Um, and then um, finally, I think the next step in all of this, which um, I'm happy to talk about in the um, Q&A section, um, but it, it, this is a whole other conversation and a whole other presentation is um, then thinking about incorporating, once you have that self-awareness and you've thought through, okay, here's who I am, here's what I need, here's what the other person, what kind of person could possibly meet those needs. Then the whole other part, there's a whole other part or a whole uh, a next step that would include how that could be communicated, engaged in another person. So you, when you want to determine, okay, I know like this is what I need. Let's say Rahman needs a person who is going to make her feel secure. How on earth is she supposed to tell if that person um, uh, can actually accomplish that and fulfill those needs? One part of it is communication. So being really upfront and very clear around what areas of needs do exist. Um, but another part of it, when she's, after she, communicates that and after she has a system for allowing um, the person to know that those are the case, like those are her needs, are what she should look for in making sure that or trying to do her due diligence in finding a person who can um, um, is able um, to meet those needs. And that concludes the presentation part of um, tonight's talk. So um, let's transition into um, having um, folks share any questions or thoughts that they may have. Um, and I'm happy to talk about them. Uh, Zainab, would you like me to read you the questions? Would you like to read them, um, the ones in the chat, whatever way is most comfortable for you? Um, I think you, why don't you read them so that maybe everybody, we make sure everybody has sure. heard them. But, yeah. So our first question is, how much do you subscribe to the idea that marriage isn't going to, sorry, multiple are coming in and then I lost it. How much do you subscribe to the idea that marriage isn't going to fulfill all of your needs, i.e. that people, that people should be as fully self-actualized as possible before entering marriage and that spouses shouldn't be responsible for fixing each other? Um, good question. Um, I think that's a great question. Let me reflect on the question for a second. I think that's a great question because, Hold on. um, we, I'm happy this person, um, asked the question because it's important to distinguish between self-actualization and meeting of needs. So, um, there are, there's a difference between, um, thinking about fixing each other and, um, meeting each other's needs. Those are two very different things. Fixing each other, first of all, comes with a certain level of expectation around, um, another per like two people who need fixing coming to each other with the expectation that they are going to fix each other. One of the things that we can do to answer this question is define very clearly what we mean by having another person who's able to meet some of the basic needs that you have um, and having a system where you expect the other person to um, uh, address all of the grievances that you have with this world, including like your inability to self-actualize and meet some of your own needs. 
the, in fact, the whole point of having this conversation and the whole point of building this self-awareness and um, building this, um, doing the self-reflection is to be clear about the things that you need, but then most importantly, before entering a partnership with someone, having a conversation around being on the same page around the kind of the kinds of needs that you're not forced to complete, but that you are willing and you're actually in, interested and excited and engaged um, in to meet for the other person. Because if you, in the same way that you, when you, when you develop this sense of self-awareness, you get a good self-awareness around the things that you need, but you also then get a sense of self-awareness around the kinds of needs that you can meet for another person. So the point is that when you have these conversations, you're able to be um, honest and accountable with yourself. Are these, when, this, when I'm having these, when I'm observing this person to be in this way, or when this person is sharing with me that they have these particular needs, am I down, um, able and down to, work with this person you know, through a life partnership um, in assisting them and supporting them in fulfilling their needs. Because I think when we, when we think about it from the perspective of fixing each other, it comes from a very deficit, um, um, I, which, is, which is a very real issue that does exist, but the basis of it is from a very deficit um, perspective. Like you're thinking we're coming in because people have deficits and we're trying to fix it. An alternative to that is we are so into each other and we value each other so much so that the things in each other, the needs that we have in each other are not, they're not necessarily burdens. They're not a nuisance. It's actually a thing that I'm excited to be supportive of the other person. And that's a different, um, it's a different way of thinking about it. That doesn't necessarily, that like the, the um, thought process around people thinking that they enter a marriage because, you know, another person is going to fix all of their problems. Or once they are into a marriage, they have expectations that the other person is going to fix their problems definitely does exist. We're not saying that doesn't exist. But if we're thinking about it from the perspective of folks who are looking for um, their spouse and looking to select their spouse, Ask yourself if you are interested and engaged in helping the other person fulfill their needs. Right, so I'm gonna go to the next question. Um, what are some red flags to look out for when discussing wants and needs? All right, what are red flags? Um, so let's divide this. Let me think about the question for a second. Let's divide this into two parts. So let's divide this into um, red flags when you are when you share your needs and another person is listening to your, you share your needs and when another person shares their needs. So those are two, two things that can happen. So you could be sharing your needs with another person and another person could respond in a particular way. And then the other, you may also be hearing another person's needs. One of the biggest red flags that I would say one should look for, and what I'm going to do is actually, I'm going to, Again, I'm gonna ask that we shift the question a tiny bit. So instead of red flags, one of the things I encourage you to look for is especially in the context of you expressing, after you do your homework and you determine what is a need and what is a want and what is a need that is an area of improvement and what is the need that actually like, there's room for that need to be exercised and all of that. When you share your needs, what I encourage you to look for is um, a certain level of malleability and flexibility in the person's thinking and in the person's response to what you are sharing. So when they, when you express yourself and when, when you are saying like, this is a value that is particularly important to me for this particular reason, to what extent are they able to exercise flexible thinking to say, okay, Maybe I know exactly what you're saying and maybe I can be super supportive in what you're saying. But maybe I also don't know what you're talking about, but you know what? I'm a problem solver. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think through 
how I can be supportive in that. Those two things, so it's not, you. one thing to look for is, you know, the person having similar frames of reference for understanding what you're saying. But another thing to look for is a person who's down and willing to be a problem solver in, you know, thinking about different solutions and different ideas and brainstorming and coming up with a way of um, addressing what you what you are raising. That would be one thing that I would definitely say is important for um, for you to for you to to look for. So the opposite of that would be the red flag. But let's frame it in in more like what to look for. And then when you're thinking about when the other person is sharing their needs, um, what I would encourage you again to look for would be. Um, for a person who is searching for, one thing I would especially be mindful of is this distinction between the areas of improvement and versus a sense of entitlement. So sometimes um, one of the things I would say for you to really look for is when folks are able to verbalize some of their needs as areas that may be potential vulnerabilities, maybe they're areas that they recognize that they are needs in them, but they recognize that Maybe it's an extra, it's going to be an extra burden on their partner. Maybe they're, so what you want to look for is the other person making space for the fact that you meeting their needs may also place a certain level of stress on you. When you hear that and when you see that, you know that, that you meeting that person's needs is going to be a lot smoother because you may put a lot of effort, but that person is making space for the fact that this may be difficult for you. That's one thing that I would definitely say, look for. The, the flip side of that is a person who's very entitled in um, expecting their partner to be um, you know, there for them in meeting all of the needs that they have because that's what marriage is about. And that's what the thing that, you know, I'm just coming into this with all of my baggage and I just expect you to be the person who's carrying it for me type of vibes. You're muted. Sorry, I had a very difficult time unmuting myself. Hedia. Yeah. Okay. Um, Zainab, I love you. This lecture is so enlightening. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so I had a question. Um, so this is all well and good when you're when you're searching for a spouse, like when you're starting to enter a relationship, but realistically, a lot of people end up entering relationships with people who aren't this uh, self-aware. I feel like most people aren't this self-aware. So what do you do once you're in a relationship with someone who has like this sense of entitlement about what their spouse is supposed to be like in terms of like dedication of their time? And um, it's mostly dedication of time. I feel like it's a big thing, like sacrifices that you expect your spouse to make for you. Mm -hmm. How do you address that with a spouse before having to like drag them to therapy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think the, in this, what I want to share can actually be applied in a lot of other circumstances and situations as well. The first question that I encourage you to always ask when there's any behavior in someone, in yourself, but in, or in another person that bothers you. So in this case, it is the other person expecting you to spend a lot of time with them and all that. The first question is why? Why is it that this person First of all, why is it that this person requires us to spend this amount of time with each other? It sounds like in, in the way that you described the, um, the question that you've already determined that like that you don't exactly vibe with the number of hours or amount of time that you think those two couples should be spending with each other. So, but the, the first question would be to say, where is the person coming from? What kinds of needs in them is not being met? that is leading them to um, need a, like an increased amount of time between the couple to be spent with each other um, than, what one of the, than what the other person is expecting. And then once you can figure out and ideally discuss with the person, like, where, like what, what, where is this coming from? Why is this a thing? Um, what, are some of the, what are some of the needs in you that are not being met? by us not spending enough time with each other. If there's room for 
that conversation because you, most of the times what happens in therapy is that like people work through their thoughts together in a safe space. So if the couple is able to work through their thoughts together, two things happen. One, if the person who wants more time is able to express, is actually able to do the exercise of thinking about, wait, why do I want more time with this person? If they're able to do that exercise and answer those questions, it makes them feel more agentic. So that actually accomplishes one of their basic psychological needs. It makes them feel like there's space for me. There's space for me to assert myself and get my needs met. And then there's a certain level of um, uh, insight that both people develop into maybe you have an increased level of anxiety in needing there to be extra um, like face-to-face -face or physical contact between the two people. And that extra physical contact fulfills this basic need for um, maybe it's a fear of abandonment that that's like on one extreme side of the spectrum. Maybe it's just physiological anxiety to environmental stressors and the person is has a very close attachment with the person who he wants or he or she wants to spend time with. But if it once that once you're able to answer the why and once you're able to think, okay, here's the underlying reason for why this is happening, then you're able to first have more the person who isn't spending as much time is able to first have more empathy for what may be going on, but more importantly, it's sometimes it becomes possible to meet that underlying psychological need without changing the plan or the logistics of the number of hours they're spending with each other. Maybe there is a way to improve the quality of the time in the hours that are spent with each other. Or maybe there is a way for the person who's not spending as much time to communicate that they do care about their partner in a different way um, so that they're meeting that basic psychological need, but they don't necessarily have to shift the number of hours. The basic question is, what is these number of hours that we're spending together um, emblematic of? What is it like exemplifying? Maybe we can, maybe we can um, fulfill that need in a different way so that it doesn't get in the way of both people's, so that both people are able to get their needs met. That was great, thank you. Okay, next question. How much of the 16 personalities of the MBTI Myers-Briggs or the attachment styles are going to help us determine our needs and wants for a life partner? Or more generally, just how much do they matter and can help us in choosing a spouse? I think I would say, um, in general, structure is great. I personally love um, structured ways of working through problems. So AKA, you know, I mean, as evidenced by the kinds of presentations I've put together, like you start from the bottom, you have like, you know, sequences of things that you kind of build on top of each other and then you problem solve and you think through things together with them. So it's a tool. It's certainly some of these, these personality tests and understanding each other's attachment styles are definitely tools that can be used as um, only tools for conversations that happen between two people. First of all, um, uh, the va validity of some of those tests they don't, they're not necessarily always statistically valid for all groups of people. They have different levels of validity, validity across different cultural groups, et cetera. So we can't always say that those tests are exactly going to tell you exactly what kind of person you are. But what they can do is to give you a tool. It's kind of like having a, going to a museum together. You go to like, you, you know, you're considering somebody for marriage and you go to a museum together and both of you are reflecting on the kinds of paintings that you see on the wall. That's a tool. The kinds of paintings that you like don't necessarily tell you the kind of person you are, but it's a tool for you to first be able to express yourself and well, look, like here are the categories and, you know, the um, types of, um, I don't know, the, I forget the five, the, with the big five, at, at least, um, the here's how much, like how extroverted I am and here's how conscientious I am and here's how whatever I am. But then, so that's one step, self-expression. You can kind of get yourself expressed in that way and reflect on it together. You can hear the other person express themselves using that tool and telling you about themselves using those tools. But I think more importantly, what matters more is then where you take that conversation and 
elevating the conversation beyond those the psychometric tool that is at your hands because um understanding each other's needs and wants is um it goes a lot deeper than what those tools can offer you so i think it, it is a good starting point i i like the idea i like the structure that it gives you and kind of like going through it together um but i think that you have to go beyond that to try to get some depth in 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 the conversations around like what your needs and wants are thank you zainab uh next question salam sister do you think marriage within three to six months of meeting someone is viable and sound or is muta for six to, six to 24 months a more viable option mm -hmm. um well, let's try to get, hmm. I'm not sure if the question is whether, are they mutually exclusive? Like is the person getting married three to, within three to six months or should they do a temporary marriage for six to 24 months and then that's, get married? That's are they the same person? That's the stress. So Salam sister, do you think marriage within three to six months of meeting someone is viable and sound or is Muta for six to 24 months of a more viable option? I think, I think they're that, asking which is better. No, I think Zainab uh, Hussein, you were right in the beginning. I think they're saying, should you commit to like a lifelong relationship in three to six months or is uh -huh. it better to pursue a Muta first and then transition that into a long-term relationship? Afterwards. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for clarifying. So the same, first things first, um, without more context, it's impossible to give an answer to that question because um, for certain groups of people, three to six months is enough. And it's a great idea for them to um, make a lifelong commitment to each other and move forward. For other groups of people, three to six months is not enough and they should not get involved after three to six months of speaking with each other. For some groups of people um, having a doing like a temporary thing before with the purpose of going into making it into a long term um, thing could be beneficial and for certain groups not so it's really difficult to answer that question without a lot of context I invite the person to um, if they're interested in you know chatting about it more they can, can feel feel free to um, touch base with me directly but let's give like some general um, guidelines. Um, this issue of, and I think this is really important, especially for those, those of us, especially for those of us on this call who may be navigating multiple cultures, but also just generally speaking, like a Muslim Americans in general, but especially those of us who may be navigating the way marriage is done in um, cultures outside of um, like what happens locally here in the US and then what happens here. Um, and a lot of, I think a lot of it has to do with, um, at least a part of it has to do with people's preferences around what is standard and what feels to be like a um, you know enough amount of time to get to know somebody and what is the standard for how much you need to know a person. In a lot of cultures, especially cultures from which um, our parents and you know folks have um, come from, but then also you know locally as well. Um, when you speak with someone after a couple of months, that, that's the threshold for how much you should get to know someone. And then after that, the amount of knowing of someone, like the, the whatever you feel towards that person after those couple of months is the threshold. You, at that point, you should be able to make a decision. All right, like, can we meet each, meet each other's needs and wants? And am I into this person or not? Yes, no, moving on. The reason I think, I'm, I'm inclined to say is that the threshold of how much you need to know a person before committing to them is different. People are socialized to, in a lot of those cultures, folks are socialized to be ready to make a commitment, even when they may not necessarily feel like they know a person a hundred percent. Navigating a culture like the US and being socialized here teaches you that if you're going to make a commitment to someone, and if you're going to give so much of yourself to someone, you best know who you're getting involved with. And you best be ready because you're going to be like sacrificing yourself and your sense of self is going to be under question. And like, there's no way that you're going to get out of it. And it just feels like the end of the world. 
So because it feels like that, a lot of times it feels a lot more intense and you feel like the level that you need to know some, know, know someone, like you really need to know them in order to feel like you're prepared to make that level of commitment to that person. I think what, and there's no, I don't think there's a right or wrong necessarily. People are socialized in different um, contexts. There are, there's room for people to be socialized in different cultural contexts and like be raised in different ways. But I do think that it's really, really important once, let's say in this particular person's question, once like the three to six months, I think, um, yeah, once the, once the um, like six months passes, I think it's really important to ask a, ask um, yourself a critical question. Why am I, after six months of talking to someone, why is it that I am or am not feeling solid in being able to commit to this person? Is it coming from my inability to commit to a person in general? So is it that the idea, and again, notice how we're engaging in self-awareness here. Is it coming from the idea that engaging in self-awareness, I'm sorry, engaging in committing to someone is generally speaking a difficult task for me? Or is it that no, like this person has some red flags and I'm still not sure. And maybe I've like, maybe I've heard like, you know, um, mixed messages from them. And maybe, like, maybe there's some other reason, because a lot of times, generally speaking, um, after like speaking for about six months, I would say that you, you're kind of like, you have a, you have an understanding of who the person is and you kind of start to get a sense for whether you're ready to make a commitment to them or not, unless there are like these other red flags. So it just becomes really, really important if you're considering that the temporary approach after those six months period, it's so important to ask yourself, why are you really avoiding that commitment? Like, what are you tr really trying to accomplish? Thank you, Zainab. Sorry, I was having a good time in the chat. <laughs> so the next question is, do men and women have different needs? Do men want to feel wanted slash needed as providers or protectors? Is gender a factor when it comes to some people's needs? Wait, can you read that again? I was trying to understand why we were talking about violence, and now I understand. Can you read it again? <laughs> Do men and women have different needs? Do men want to feel wanted slash needed as providers or protectors? Is gender a factor when it comes to people's needs? <laughs> um, well, um, let me think about how I'm gonna answer that for just a second. So let's, let's start similar to how we started this um, presentation. Let's start from the foundation. Like let's start with a foundational approach to answering that question. Our creator, the one who created us, um, created two different genders. There were, there are, and we're, I'm not getting into, a, a, you know, other conversations about gender, but Allah created us in, in, in these two different genders. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason that you are, like those of us who are women, are the way that we are created as women and we are created in this particular way. And those of us, those of us who are, um, uh, well, not me, but those people who are male are created male. There is a wisdom to that creation. This isn't, we can't ignore the fact that that's how creation occurred. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the messages that you likely get on a daily basis from, especially in this socio-political environment, um, I feel is not really attuned to that really basic premise. So there's this basic premise that the one who created us created these two systems. And then, you know, for centuries, these two systems of these two like gender groups um, existed. Let's acknowledge the fact that there is a reason for that. There, there, something was supposed to come out of the fact that these two genders um, exist. So that means that your experience as um, a woman or your experience as a man is certainly going to influence the kinds of needs that you have and the kinds of wants that you have. The part of this that, so let's, let's kind of put that as, um, as kind of like a basic premise. But one of the biggest things that influences why those differences may exist 
has to do with the kind of environment that you're socialized in. And some, when we aren't able to differentiate between um, the environment that you're socialized in and what just feel, like what is just right and what is just supposed to be, um, I think that's where a lot of the conflicts ends, ends up happening and a lot of the bad decisions that people make end up coming about. When you are, when you're, you know, born as a um, girl or a boy, you end up going through very, very different life experiences. From the moment that you're born, you experience life differently. First of all, your physiology can be different. And um, I don't know, like your, I forget what it is, but like even your muscle mass in as a, like a woman tends to be different than just generally speaking, than um, men. And then like, I uh, promise you women's ability to carry something heavy for long periods of time is definitely more than men's because, you know, they, their body has to be prepared for carrying um, children, et cetera, right? So there are, from the physiological aspects all the way to the socialization that you experience, things are different. Life is, life is different. You just experience the world, the threats that, experience, that exist in the world, the um, coping mechanisms that exist in the world, all of that can be different. So of course, your, the way that your needs are developed and the way that your wants are developed, um, are, they are going to be different and it is going to make a difference. But here's my recommendation to folks who are, um, uh, especially folks who are have, starting to have some of those conversations with like potential partners, or even in the beginning of like partner, I mean, you know, whenever, even in, if you are in a partnership, if you've been in a part, like in a marriage for a long time, but especially for folks who are trying to um, have these conversations, I really encourage you to um, be really aware and try to stay away from the gender tropes that exist in, 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 in our language um, and mm, minimize our experiences down to the gender and the label that the gender ascribes to us and all of the characteristics that those gender labels ascribe to us because that is pretty limiting. When you play somebody as like you say, yeah, you know what, I'm a man and like my, um, here's all the expectations that exist of me as a man. So, okay, now that I'm going into this conversation with this young woman, I best like stay within these boundaries and make sure that I am upholding whatever is expected of a man. And even if I have a need that falls outside of what is expected of a man, I'm not gonna feel comfortable to be able to share that and let that out. But then like five years later or five months later, when I actually get into a partnership with this person and then like the needs are going to come gushing out, that person is not going to be prepared to deal with them. And the vice, vice versa is also true. If, I will, if I'm a woman and I have certain needs and now I feel like, you know, within these gender boundaries, I'm not going to be able to share these needs or it may not be appropriate. It may not be what is expected of a respectable, whatever young woman and then later, I mean, at the end, if you do end up getting married to that person, at some point it's gonna come out and that, then you're gonna be in trouble. So I would just encourage folks to be aware of the way that the creator has created you and the social experiences that you have had in um, building your personhood um, as who you are, including your gender, but try not to fall into the, um, all the um, tropes that exist around what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man and trying to stay within those boundaries and. Mm, situating your conversations around that. Great, thank you, Zainab. Um, so we do have a few more questions, but we are only going to answer one more. And if it's okay with um, Sister Zainab, I will put your email in the chat and perhaps people can email you uh, with their questions if we were not able to get to them. So the last one um, is I have been living alone for a while now and I feel like I have found ways to adapt and fulfill the needs I have that would have been fulfilled by a spouse. So now sometimes I think what need will a spouse be able to fulfill and what will I lack if I don't have a spouse? Can you expand on that and perhaps give examples of needs? Very good question. I love that question. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think that's a, I think that's a great question. And um, the reason is that um, at some point, I think future generations, um, especially folks who are like socialized in 
cultures like the ones that we are navigating now are going to start moving towards that direction slowly and slowly there's going to be like this kind of uptake in that kind of mentality which is like it's a it's actually a very natural um development it's a very natural social development you're in a situation kind of like you're like you're in a groove like you're you're doing pretty good like you're you're taking care of yourself you're vibing you have a good social support system um and I wouldn't be surprised if like you've heard a lot about um, some of the challenges that people have faced when they have to navigate partnerships and it feels like a lot of work. Who knows if it's going to even be fulfilling. There's like so much unpredictability involved in it. I think that's the benefit. So there's so much room for that. Like there's so much. I want, I want to validate that and say that there's a lot of room and space for that being somebody's reality. That's a thing. It happens. Um, the first thing, and I think the, that's actually why I um, started off our conversation with trying to answer the question, why does this matter? Why should I do this anyways? Sometimes um, we're placed in situations in this world where our um, way of life, aka Islam, tells us to do things that don't may not necessarily make sense to us, or they may just not feel like they're relevant to us. Maybe they're not, they just feel like in my particular case, like this doesn't feel like it's, it's necessarily um, uh, related. That's exactly why I started the conversation with the point of um, marriage being contextualized in what the creator has intended for you to accomplish. So whatever you have accomplished thus far, kudos to you, that has also been as a result of the blessings that Allah has bestowed upon you and like you, um, all that you have accomplished is um, likely like awesome sauce, you're in a good space. But that same creator who got you to this part and showered you with blessings to get you into this, kind of bring you into this peaceful place where you feel like you're in a good place is also the same creator who has decreed for you to be a person who is open to the idea not necessarily like rushing into the idea, but open into the idea of living life in a partnership. Um, the, the way that that same creator intended for you to navigate this, all that this world is going gonna, is gonna to bring about and all that you're going to traverse in this world is through the structure of a partnership with another person. And there is a reason embedded in there that you may not necessarily understand. It may be beyond the scope of what makes sense to you right now. But there is, when he has intended for that to be the case, it means that there is a reason behind it. Even for a person who doesn't have, who doesn't necessarily has the urge or need or desire to feel like they want um, uh, uh, to get married. Because you're, I, I actually agree, you're right, there is this, um, the rhetoric is that like, you know, all the needs that you have in terms of a sense of belonging and competence and structure and all of that, it, it comes in the form of getting married, because a lot of our cultures are structured that way, like the reasonable next step is that. But that's, that's not how Allah intended it necessarily for it to be. It's not like this thing that you just naturally do next just because you feel like it or just because you have that need and you want the need to be met it's a part of if you think about it as part of a piece of a puzzle as part of the structure of a lost structural plan for this earth there's a reason a part there's a reason for engaging in it that's beyond just the basic needs just meeting the basic happy needs that you may have and there is a wisdom in it that you may not necessarily fully grasp right now but if you do trust in the fact that the same creator who got you to the point where you are where you're experiencing this peace got you to this place then you, you the only way to move forward and to take a step towards this approach is to trust in that the same creator who has given you this level of peace has an even higher level of peace and an even higher level of tranquility and good vibes for you in a partnership with another person Great. Thank you so, so, so very much, Zainab. We 
are so lucky to have a Stanford PhD share their wisdom and grace us with their presence. So thank you so much. Thank you for putting together such a comprehensive presentation. We know you're super busy, so we appreciate it so much. And the chat is like blowing up with people saying thank you. So thank you very much. Um, before we go, Hetty, I'm just going to give you an opportunity to give an overview of what COTHAT is and the work that we're doing there. And then uh, we will say goodbye to everybody. Okay, so thank you again, Dr. Zainab. This was amazing. We always love having you and obviously like the audience always loves having you. It's never not been a pleasure. But, okay, so Zainab mentioned this at the beginning of the hour or hour and a half, and uh, I saw maybe one or two comments in the chat related to this, but basically Mohiboyan has started another initiative called the Kothashia Singles Network. And the point of that initiative is not to be a matchmaking service. Um, we're not doing the substantial work of like letting people make profiles and then match people based on compatibility. Um, because we're, we find that the people we know who are engaging in like apps and going traditional routes where they do do compatibility and your based, your matches are based on criteria first versus, um, uh, versus what is the word that I'm looking for? It's not charisma, it's uh, chemistry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> based on criteria versus based on chemistry is that we, a lot of people find that even if somebody is perfect on paper, once you start talking to them, there's nothing there. <laughs> like, And we find that in our experience, when we base the start of relationships or like screening people out based on just criteria, we put a lot of our, or we miss, we misattribute a lot of our needs or our wants as needs, which is what Zainab was talking about, that the things that we think are like necessary for us to have a good relationship with someone, a lot of them happen to be wants versus needs. And when you have a list of criteria, you end up weeding out a lot of people who might be potentially great matches for you, but you're never gonna talk to them because they didn't match one of your criteria. So we are in our initiative are only our only goal is just to give people access to like all of the potential singles who are within their region of like where they can move to or can't move from and within like a reasonable age range for them. There's like your preferred age range and then we go a little bit above and a little bit below that. Uh, so the goal is literally just to get you access to see, because you know, somebody mentioned in the chat that as she as we are like a minority community within a minority community within a minority community. Um, if that's something that you think is important to you when searching for a spouse, and a lot of us do prefer to look within like the Shia community first before expanding to all Muslims. Um, it's hard to do that within just your own community because we're all in these small pockets and it's hard to access like people from like a New York community or a California community like you hear about these people, but you don't have a way of like forming any kind of relationship with them to see if you'd be interested in someone there. So our goal is literally just to connect you with those people and just through as natural a conversation as possible, we post some discussion topics. Not all of them are super heavy about like what you expect in a marriage. Some of them are just light. Uh, some of them are those heavy topics. And if you find that somebody has similar ideas to you, you don't know anything about them besides that they are within a reasonable age range and that um, they have the same ideas as you, you would let us know and we'll connect you. And then you can go from there talking separately to see if there's a, a relationship that could potentially evolve from that. Um, we're really excited about this initiative. This, our first event is going to be this coming Saturday. Uh, registration is closed, but we're definitely going to have more. Um, we are really, really like, we really want our, our approach to this to be like based in psychology. So we are so excited to have Zainab give this talk like, in conjunction with that event. And we hope that for future events, we can do even more like create like a healthy relationships packet or something that goes out to all attendees or like a little like mini class that you attend before a lecture or something like that. Um, really, we're really excited. We hope that we're, we hope that what we're doing is going to meet a need in the community. And thank you again for sticking around and listening to this part of it. Follow us on Instagram. It's at Kothar Network. You can do that through the Mohiban Youth Instagram as well. Um, thank you all again for coming. Thank you so much, Zainab and Zainab. Thank you, Dr. Hosseini. We are around for part two.
inshallah. Yes, inshallah. I um, encourage folks to first. I I encourage folks to support you guys in the Kalthad event that you guys are doing. Like I said, I support. Um, inshallah, it goes. It's very fruitful, and Allah guides all of us in doing it. Um, and stay tuned for part two of this talk, inshallah. Hello, is everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.